Listen, we are in week three, I believe, of our sermon series entitled Rivers of Revival. Amen. Rivers of Revival. And God is going to do an amazing things. And we're going to continue with that theme, that sermon series today. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 2. Y'all ready for the word in the building? If you're ready for the word, say, oh yeah. oh, yeah. Exodus chapter 2, please stand on your feet. Verse 1, I'm going to read a few scriptures. The Bible says this, And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. She hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. Verse 4, And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark coming, uh, when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, "This is one of the Hebrews' children." Remain standing, but. Before we get into the sermon, I want to pray real quick. Let me give you my title. The title for the sermon today is Trust the River. <laughs> Trust the River. God, we thank you that your word is spirit. It is life. And your word would do a work in here today. Obliterate the plans of hell. And God, let your name be glorified and praised. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Trust the river. In this text, a little bit of background that leads into the verses that we read today. There's a situation going on in the nation of Israel. They are in Egypt and they are growing. The nation is swelling. Um, so many babies are being born and the nation is multiplying. To the extent that Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, looks at how fast this nation is growing, and he says, we gotta do something about this severe growth in population. And so Pharaoh sends out this edict, this command, whereas all of the boys, the male children, they must be killed. If a male ch child is born, Pharaoh says the male children should be killed. So that sets off this fire of persecution in this time. It releases persecution throughout the nation of Israel. That every morning they're hearing cries coming from the mouths of mothers who are just pleading and weeping over their children who have been murdered. You can't walk through the streets without hearing the cries of a father who has just lost his son. There is persecution going on all around this nation. And so as we jump into our text today, the Bible says there was this special mom, and she was from the tribe of Levi, and she had this son. She had this baby, and when she looked at him, she realized this baby was unique, he was uncommon, he was blessed, he was a great child. He was spectacular. She just, she just knew there was something special about this child. And what I learned about the text as I began to read it is that it is interesting how this blessing in the form of a male child came in the middle of adversity. In the middle of persecution, 
There was this blessing that was born in adversity. And it caused me to ponder and think about the many times that God will release blessings in adversity. Yes. That when we are going through our seasons of persecution, we often feel as if God has forgotten about us. We often feel like God has turned his back on us, but some of the best blessings come out of adversity. And if there's somebody in the room today, somebody watching me online that is going through great struggle, I want to give you confidence today that even though you are going through adversity, it doesn't mean that God does not have a blessing for you. Yeah. That God wants to give you a blessing in the middle of the storm. Yeah. He wants to give you a blessing in the middle of controversy. Yeah. He wants to give you a blessing in the middle of your trouble. Because God provides blessings in adversity. And sometimes because the adversity around us is so strong, we can neglect the blessing that God wants to push My through God. us. Right. Because God wants to give something to us, we actually sometimes neglect the blessing that he wants to give to us because all we can see is the adversity around us. And somebody in the room, you need to start looking at your situation through the eyes of the spirit so that you can see a blessing that God wants to birth in adversity. I'm coming for somebody in the room right now yes. who is feeling like this is the absolute worst time. This is the absolute most troubling time. And there's no way that God can bring a blessing in the middle of this calamity. Yes. God cannot bring a blessing in the middle of this valley. Well, I have news for you. The Bible tells us today that there is a woman that births a child and she realizes that God God does produce blessings Hallelujah. in adversity. God, maybe, maybe there's nobody that's going through anything today. Maybe there's nobody in the room that has a problem or a struggle. But maybe I just need to preach to myself. And maybe this word is perhaps for me. Because when I see, think of some of the things that I have to face, I get, I get confidence in God. Because I know that God still wants to bless me. That my circumstances don't dictate the blessings of God. Mm-hmm. God wants to bring blessings through adversity. Mm -hmm. And I look back over my life and I realized it was in the most adverse times yeah. Yeah. in life that God brought the greatest blessings. Yeah. I'm thinking about Link Church and many people here who have gone through next, who are a part of our church, know our story. Um, you've heard the story where um, years ago when PJ was pregnant with our son Caleb that she was in the middle of childbirth and the doctor realized that the umbilical cord was wrapped around my son's neck and they rushed her to emergency surgery they had to do an emergency c-section and we bust through the doors of the emergency room and they pull my son out and for about 15 to 20 seconds, there was a silence in the ER room. And I wasn't sure in that moment, Rebecca, I was not sure if we were gonna go home with a son. And after about 15, 20 seconds, they were working on him. He began to cry. And today he is a healthy, Amen. intelligent, Amen. vibrant young boy with no complications. But we always give God praise for that because a few days or a few weeks after that, we were just thinking about it. And God said something to us that we'll never forget. He said, hey, I want you guys to go to Charlotte and I want you guys to launch a church in Charlotte because just like your son was choking on an umbilical cord. There are people in that city that are choking yes. on drugs. They're choking on depression. They're yes. choking on anxiety. Yes. They're choking on bad relationships. Yes. And I want to send you to bring life yes. 
to people that are choking. In one of the greatest predicaments and seasons of pain that we ever experienced, God brought a blessing. And Link Church is here today because in adversity, God birthed a blessing. The blessing that came through our pain is the reason why we're able to stand here today and give God praise. And the blessing that is Link Church came out of a scary moment. And maybe somebody today, you need to see that God wants to give you a blessing in adversity. And this woman, this mother of Moses, the baby is Moses, she looks at how great this son is. She looks at the fact that this son is pleasing. She realizes that he is blessed. But because of the circumstances surrounding them, she has to hide him. He is blessed, but she has to hide him. Mm -hmm. he, he is blessed, but he must be concealed. He is blessed, and she has to keep him under cover. In order to preserve his life, she cannot expose him because of the situation that is going on around them. And it is interesting because sometimes God hides you. And he will hide you in the shadows. He will hide you in the backdrop of your life. He will hide you in the darkness and the dungeons of life. And you'll feel like, God, I know I'm blessed. God, I know you have great things for me to do. And why is it, God, that I'm not more exposed? Why is it, God, that nobody sees me? Why is it, God, that my business doesn't get off the ground? Why is it, God, that my relationship isn't prosperous? How come, God, other people, it's their video that goes viral? Why is it, God, that they get the exposure that I felt like you have called me to have? And I realized something, that exposure is not the barometer in which you should measure blessing. Mm -hmm. your, your, your blessing is not determined by exposure. I feel God already. Just because God has you hidden doesn't mean that you are any less blessed. Yes, somebody in the room that feels blessed today, every time you turn around, it seems like you are blessed, but you're also blocked. Mm -hmm. You're blessed and you're blocked in your finances. You're blessed and you're blocked in your mind, in your mentality. You're blessed and you're blocked in your career. And you're saying, God, if I'm so blessed, why am I blocked? But sometimes God hides you, not to hurt you, but sometimes God hides you to help you. Yes, I feel God. God is in the room today. God will hide you, not because he's out to hurt you, but God will hide you because he's trying to help you. And your being blocked is no indication of how blessed you are. And somebody in the room that knows you are blessed, whether or not they applaud you. Somebody in the room that knows you are blessed, whether or not they pat you on the back. I need you to open your mouth real quick and say, I'm blessed. Yes. I'm blessed whether or not you like my video. I'm blessed whether or not you follow me. I'm blessed whether or not my boss says I've done a great job. I know who I am. I am the blessed of God. I am God's child. He, I am the apple of his eyes. I am blessed in the city. I am blessed in the field. I am blessed whether or not a relationship affirms who I am. I know who I am. I don't need anybody else to affirm me. My God has blessed me. He has anointed my head with oil. He has overflowed my cup. I need somebody in the room. Shout one more time and let hell know that you are blessed. Somebody shout, I'm blessed in here. In case you forgot, I'm blessed. Don't look at my car, don't look at my house and try and measure whether or not I am blessed. I'm blessed. I'm hidden, but I'm blessed. I'm concealed, but I'm blessed. And it 
reminds me that God often hides his most prized possessions. The fact that God is hiding you is not because you're not blessed, but God is hiding you because you are blessed. Uh, God is hiding you not because you have nothing to offer the world, but God is hiding you because you have something to offer the world. And if God had to be hidden, then you have to be hidden. My Bible tells me that God, the King of glory, the Almighty One, the one that has power in His hands, the one that created the universe and the earth, when God got ready to walk the streets of the earth, when God got ready to come down as a man, God did not skip steps, but God wrapped Himself in the canopy of Mary's womb. He wrapped Himself in human flesh. And you would think because God is King of kings and Lord of lords that when he is born in the earth, you would think that he would be sitting on the throne. But God is not born in a palace. Jesus is born in a stable. He is hidden. He is hidden. I wish somebody would understand the power of being hidden. Jesus was hidden in a dark, rancid, smelly stable. And it didn't diminish who he was. It didn't diminish whether or not he was the son of God. It didn't diminish his glory and his power. And sometimes people judge what is inside the container based on what they can see on the outside of the container. And you can't judge me by my package. Yes, you can't judge me by my container. I may be concealed in this season, but it doesn't mean I'm not blessed. I'm blessed. I'm hidden, but I'm blessed. I'm, I'm hidden, and I'm blocked. Somebody that feels frustrated today, you're being blocked, and it's like, man, God, I, I just can't seem to get this business plan going. I just can't seem to find the right people to partner with me. I, I just feel so, so blocked. I mean, my family's okay, and if things are going, uh, I would say so-so, but I just want more out of life. Why is it that I don't feel like I'm getting more out of life? And every time I turn around, somebody else is completing their goals or reaching their goals and, and aspiring to new heights. And how come, God, it seems like I'm so stuck? And, and, and God hides you when he wants to protect you thank you lord because some of y'all in here you don't know the blessing of being hidden yes. mercy. you you don't know how blessed it is to be hidden and to wait yeah because you're so impatient My God. your problem is is that you want to expose what God is going to do in your life prematurely. Your problem is you can't keep your mouth shut. Every time God gives you a great idea, you put it on Facebook. Every, every time God does something great in your life, you, you somehow put it on social media. Every time God does something great in your life, all of a sudden you want to broadcast it. Every time God does something great in your life, all of a sudden you want to talk about it in the town. Just turn it off, Christian. Just turn it off like Wednesday. Hit the switch. Thank you. All you want to do is tell your friends. All you want to do is tell your neighbors. You have a mouth that God is trying to keep closed. And that's why he's hiding you. Because if you prematurely expose yourself, then somehow the people that are hating on you, your adversaries are out there lurking, trying to kill you, trying to obliterate you, trying to cut off the blessing that God has in your life. And that's the problem. The problem is God wants to hide you, but you want to be exposed. You, you want to be exposed. You can just keep it off the whole time. I'm good. You want to be exposed. You want to wow. be exposed. Mm -hmm. And 
The Bible tells us. See, this is why you gotta bring your Bible to church. See, y'all out of here when I am on the screen. You gotta bring your Bible to church. I mean, if you have your phone, you should have your Bible. Because you should have a Bible on your phone. So for all the folk that got a Bible on their phone, Exodus chapter 2. And it should be easy today because Exodus is the second book of the Bible. <laughs> In verse number 3, the Bible says that she was hiding him for three months. But there came a time when she could no longer hide him. <laughs> he was growing. And she could no longer hide him. But what I thought was very interesting is that the baby was growing. But the baby was growing in the dark. That the baby didn't need exposure to grow. The baby didn't need light to grow. But the baby was growing in the arms of his mother. The baby was growing in the darkness of the house. You can imagine Moses' mother didn't turn on the light in the baby room. You can imagine Moses' mother always was closing the shutters and acting like nobody was home. She was growing her child in the dark. Somebody needs to be reminded how much you don't need light to grow you. How much there are certain things that will only grow in the dark. And if you never went through a dark season, you would never have the strength that you have today. Because God knows that certain things only grow in the dark. You'll only be more strong in your mind and in your spirit when you can grow in the dark. You'll only be so strong in your soul when you can grow in the dark. There's something about darkness that pushes us to grow. Mm -hmm. There's something about darkness that pushes us to get to a place of maturity. I'll put it like this. The Bible says that trials come to make you weak. Nah. Trials come to make you fall. Nah. Trials come to make you strong. And you've been pushing away the very darkness that God wants to use to make you strong. Paul says that we should glory in tribulation because tribulation works patience and patience experience and experience hope. You'll never get the experience that you need for the next season in your life if you don't grow in the dark. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing. It's dark, but I'm growing. I'm in pain, but I'm growing. I'm growing. And God knows that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And you don't need exposure to grow. You need darkness to grow. <laughs> God will grow you in the shadows of the Almighty. And Moses begins to grow until he is three months old. I got to push. Until he's three months old, he begins to grow. And the Bible says she could no longer hide him. His mother couldn't. She came to a juncture and a place in her life where the very blessing she had been cradling, she had been cultivating, the very blessing that she had been bonding with, she had been breastfeeding, the very blessing that she had been um, cur uh, curling up with in bed, the very blessing that kept her warm at night. The Bible says there came a time when she could no longer hide him. And, and the conundrum in the text, y'all, is what do you do when God gives you a blessing and then he tells you to release it? And, and we're in a series entitled Rivers of Revival. And I realized something about revival. Revival doesn't happen because you have your hands on it. Right. But revival happens because you're willing to take your hands off of it. Yeah. Yes. 
Because Moses is the physical manifestation, the embodiment of revival that the nation of Israel needs. Yeah. Moses encapsulates every bit of revival that is about to bust these children of Israel out of Egypt and push them into their promised land. Moses is the emancipator. Moses is the revivalist. And Moses' mom is holding revival and there comes a point and a place and a, a, a juncture in time when Moses' mom has to release revival in order for revival to happen. Somebody needs to understand that if you want revival to happen in your marriage, you want revival to happen in your finances, maybe God is taking, telling you to take your hands off of what you're trying to hold on to. And the reason why revival doesn't break out in churches, the reason why revival doesn't break out in our lives is because we're trying to control what God wants us to let go of. You control freak? Yes. You control freak? Y'all ain't in here today. I'm going to pull you into the mind of God. God looks at you and says, I can't bless you because you're a control freak. I can't bless you because you want to control when it happens, how it happens, where it happens. You want to say to God, God, this, this, this season is not a good time. It's not a good time, God, because I got kids in school. It's not a good time, God, because I just started the job. It's not a good time, God, because I don't have a job. And you want to postpone and you want to hold on to what God wants to do right now. And the reason why revival doesn't happen is because you're a control freak. You want to say, God, come in the room like this. God, do it according to my schedule. God, bless them how I want them to be blessed. But revival begins to arise in a group of people that will say, God, any way you bless me, anyhow you want to do this, God, I take my hands off of the wheel. I lift I lift my hands off of the controls. And God, I want you to take control of it. I dare somebody in the room to begin to release. Yes, release what you're holding on to. You're holding on to stress. You're holding on to worry. Because you're afraid that if you let it go, something's going to happen to it. Well, Moses' mom realized that Moses was safer on the river than he was in her house. Y'all not in a building. Y'all not in a building. She realized that her baby boy would be safer on the river than he was in her house. Because as long as Moses was in her house, Moses would be in her hands. But if Moses was on the river, then Moses would be in God's hands. Y'all not. Y'all not ready in the building today. And when you begin to trust the river, mm -hmm, and you say, God, I'm going to put my trust in the river, that my, my thing, my blessing, my idea is better off on the river than it is in my hands. Because God, if it's in my hands, I'm responsible to protect it. But God, if it's in the river, you're responsible to protect it. And maybe God wants you to let it go. Somebody shout, let it go. You got to let it go. You have to let it go. You have to let it go. It didn't happen the way that you thought it was going to happen. But if you want God to do it, you have to let it go. If you want God to open the way, you have to let it go. Can you imagine what it's like for a mom to have her son and say, I'm going to put it on the river? <laughs> I'm going to take what I've been nursing, what I've been cultivating, I'm going to let it go on the river? She has to trust the river. I entitled this sermon, Trust the River, Not Trust God. Come on. I, I, I entitled this sermon, Trust the River, right. Not Trust God. Mm -hmm. Because if you go home and read the text again, you won't see a voice coming from God. Right. Right. 
You won't see an edict, a command wow. coming from God that says, put your baby in the river. Right. She, she puts her trust in the river. She doesn't put her trust in the voice of God. And I realized that in order for revival to happen for some folks, they've got to learn how to trust the river. Because the river is a metaphor for the ways of God, not God. The river is a metaphor for the ways of God. And most Christians don't struggle with God. You struggle with the ways of God. You're struggling with the way in which God chooses to do it. You're struggling in, in the way in which God is allowing you and pushing you to walk. You're struggling with the way that God is developing your career. You're struggling with the way that God is growing your finances. You're struggling with his ways. You're struggling with the fact that God told you to move there, take that job, and then all of a sudden you have problems on the job. And you're like, God, you could have left me where I was. Why? are you doing it this way? And many Christians don't struggle with trusting God. You love God. You like God, but you actually don't get with his ways. You can't, you can't get with his ways. It's his ways. It's his ways that boggle your mind. It's his ways that confound your consciousness. It's his ways that don't make sense. Why, God, are you telling me to put this blessing in the river, in the river? God, why do I feel like the river is the thing that I need to trust? Because when you can trust God's ways, you can trust him. And if you can't trust God's ways, you can't trust him. His ways are inextricably connected to him. And God tests us through his ways. That's why David says, teach me your ways, oh God, and lead me in a plain path. I need you to make it clear for me. Make it plain, make it plain. Somebody in the room say, make it plain. Make it plain, God. I need you to make it plain. I can't always hear your voice, but if you can make the way plain, yes. If you can give me one option, God, I got three, I got four. I don't know what to do with this. God, if you can just give me one option. You see, Moses' mom doesn't need the voice of God because she only has one option, yes. Moses' mom can't give her child to her neighbor because he'll die over there. She can't give her child to her cousin because his life will be in jeopardy. Moses' mom has one option. She's got to put her baby in the river. I need somebody in the room to say, make it plain. Make it plain, God. Which way do you want me to go? Make it plain. You don't have to come down with a big booming voice. I just need you to make it plain. If I'm going to get through this, if this person is the one for me, God, make it plain. If this is the one I should marry, make it plain. God, I need you to close every door. <laughs> Don't make it confusing. God, you are the God that opens doors. But God, right now, I need you to be the God that will close doors. Close every door that I want to go through. Close every door that is enticing to me. I need you to shut it down, God. Oh, I release a shutdown anointing in the room right now that this week God will begin closing doors and exposing the river to you so that you will know the ways of God. It's unorthodox, but it's the ways of God. It's confusing, but it's the ways of God. It doesn't make sense, but it's the ways of God. How do I know it's the way of God? Because it's the only option that I have. If I'm going to make it through this, it's the only option that I have. If I'm going to survive and put food on the table, it's the only option that I have. It's the only option. I got to trust the river. I got to trust the river. Because it's the ways of God that show me which way to go. That even if I have to take my baby mm -hmm. and put it in the river, yes. I can trust 
the river yes, even when I can't hear God. My Lord. Good. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, because God. this river is the pathway to Thank revival. Yes. It's the yes. only way that I see out. It's the only way that I can get ahead. Yes. And God, if you want me to go another way, then please show it yes. to me. Yes. But if you don't show it to me, God, this is the way I'm going. Yes. I don't have any more time, God. Yes. I'm going to lose this thing. God, if there's another way, you got to show up now. Yes. But God, if there's no other way, I'm going through the door. Yes. Amen. And Moses' mom begins to trust the river. Yes. I gotta push y'all because yeah, I got push, more. Push. I got more, but what the river shows me is that you have to trust God's ways. You know, football season is here. And I always like to talk about the Dallas Cowboys. I, I see so much in them. <laughs> that if you're a Dallas Cowboys fan and a, and a couple of the Dallas Cowboys fans they're not here today but they'll hear it um, if you're a Cowboys fan it's difficult for you to trust your team because you can't trust the ways <laughs> yeah 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 that'll drop on them you, you can't trust the way in which they put the team together. You can't trust the ways that they go through the season. You can't trust that ownership is actually doing it the right way. And because you can't trust the ways, then it's difficult for you to trust your team. It's the same way with God. Because you can't trust his ways, it's difficult to trust him. I'm going to give you three things, write it down. I didn't get to extrapolate it the way I was, the way I wanted to rather, because we got to go. But the river are the ways of God, and the ways of God will show you three things or give you three things. The ways of God will give you, number one, preservation. The baby is in a basket on the river, and the baby does not drown. Thank you. When you step out in the ways of God, you won't drown. Your life is in more jeopardy when you don't go on the river. But when you go in the way of God, he'll preserve you. Number two, the baby is positioned amongst the reeds of the river along the river's bank. And the ways of God will position you. It's about positioning. Number one, preservation. Number two, positioning. You've got to be in the right place at the right time for God to work revival in your life. You can't be at home in your mother's house if you should be on the river's bank. God's ways position you. You will get the loan if you're in the right place at the right time. You'll get into the school if you're at the right place at the right time because you follow his ways. Number three, the ways of God will give you partnerships. Partnerships. Because Moses is on the river in the right place at the right time and he is preserved, he gets a partner in life. Pharaoh's daughter comes down, sees the child, and says, I want to raise this child, but you know what? I'm going to give this child back to his mother so his mother can wean him and we'll work together. So Moses' life gets partnerships. And the reason why at Link Church we're about living life connected is because when you walk in the ways of God, revival brings you into partnerships. The reason why we do connect groups at Lake Church because it's about community. And you can't go through life without partnerships. And God will lead you to a church that provides preservation, positioning, and partnerships. Yes, yes. Everyone stand, we gotta go.
Maybe one day I'll be able to dissect that more. But take notes, write it down, think about it, read the story when you go home. Read the story this week and see how God miraculously preserved Moses, positioned Moses, and brought Moses into partnerships. What does God want to do in your life right now? Every head bowed, every eye closed, all over the building. If you don't trust the river, you won't find the preservation of God, the positioning of God, and partnerships in God. Somebody in the room today, you got to trust the river. You've got to trust the ways of God. So that revival will be unlocked in you. You know, Link Church used to be all the way across town in Steel Creek. We believed that's where God wanted us. We thought that's where God wanted to grow our church, wanted to bless our church. Pandemic happened. And God opened up a way on the other side of town right here. It was unorthodox. It was a little strange to move a church all the way across town. We were worried about what's going to happen with people. Are we still going to be able to do this? But sometimes you got to trust the river. You have to trust the river. It was the only option we had to come out of a pandemic strong. You got to trust the river. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I declare in this house, trust for revival. I declare in this house that you got to let it go. Yes. Lift your hands. I declare in this house that this is the Sunday you release it. I declare in this house this is the Sunday that you say, God, I'm letting go of it. I don't want control of it anymore. I want you to take control of it. God, I trust your ways. I trust the river, God. Oh, God, I know it's strange, but God, I trust the river. And I'm letting it go. You take control of it, God. Prayer team, let's go. I want to call somebody to the altar today. That this is the day that you let it go. This is the day that you get revival. This is the day that you trust the river. Come to the front right now. We want to lay hands on you and pray for you. Yes. Yes, they're coming. They're coming. There's somebody else. They're coming. This sermon, this is the one where you begin to trust God completely. This, this is the one. There's somebody else. This is the one. 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 Somebody begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray. Prayer unlocks the heaven.
today in the room that wants to give up control and give your life to Jesus. I want to give you this opportunity. It's the best decision you can make. I just want you to simply raise your hand at the count of three. And we will. We got one already. One, two, three. Might as well count. Is there somebody else? We got one. Is there somebody else? Give up control. Give up control. Give up control. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks for watching our service today. We hope and pray that you are encouraged. We love to give here at Link. There are two convenient ways to give to our church. You can text the number 84321 or give online at linkchurchnc.org forward slash give. Join us next week for Link Online. We pray that you have a great and blessed week.